the fact that they have now opened up E3 to the public and anybody can buy a ticket and go and play these newer games, it's becoming more of a regular gaming convention. It's almost taking a little bit of like the special, like sacred feeling from back when I was a kid. Oh my god, I'm gonna slap you. I'm gonna reach across the table and slap you. You know how I always talk about that? I always threaten you. You can actually with do it with physical now. violence. You can actually do it now. Here, I'm gonna slap you right now. Go ahead. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, old times. <laughs> so, anyway. Hello, my beautiful materia. Welcome to the worst episode of Nintendo Everything Podcast. <laughs> episode 34. I am your host, Oni Dino. With me, I have a fat chocobo summon materia. It's Galen. Give me your gessel greens. <laughs> Poor chocobo. He ate so many gessel greens. <laughs> so, this is an interesting episode because we are face to face right now. I know, I know. And we usually, long term listeners of the podcast, they are going to know that we usually. Uh, do this from remote locations. However, I'm staring into his eyes right now. Uh, uh, how do they look? Squinty. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on one audio channel, and for those with the audio knowledge, um, that means that usually we're on two separate audio channels. If we talk over each other a lot, I usually move things around a bit, but can't do that this time, so we're, we're just gonna be talking over each other and yelling, and boy, this audio is not gonna sound as great. <laughs> Or is clean. So sorry about that. But, eh, what do you expect for the Nintendo Everything Podcast? Do you aim low? This is, this is gonna be the raw version. <laughs> <laughs> so I did want to say a bit of information about what's going on. My impressions pieces that I have been planning to write for Nintendo Everything have been delayed. However, all of the footage... Oh, of E3. That's the topic of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Topics are usually the important thing. They usually want to be included. Yes, for Japanese speakers, it's like E3 wa, and then you go on with your <laughs> sentence. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit delayed. Footage, though, is all uploaded on our YouTube, if I recall correctly, and interviews are going to be uploaded soon and throughout the week and moving forward. Um, I kind of wrote about this on my Twitter a bit, but I'll announce it here for those who don't follow me on the Twitter. Um, I had some family emergencies this week, so... I am trying to get this stuff done, but it's unfortunately delayed me a bit, so as the great Iwata has always said, please understand. So, what is coming up in this episode? We are going to be talking about more E3 nonsense and goodness. Yeah, I, there was a lot that happened this E3, and we definitely could not get it in our even extended episodes. So. Oh my god, I know. That last episode was the longest one we've ever done, just yeah. like the one before that and the one before that. <laughs> Let's jinx ourselves. <laughs> Galen, shut up. Let's jinx ourselves right off the bat and say that this is not going to be a long episode. But hey, the listener at home already knows. They can already see how long this file is. Yeah. Uh, a little behind the scenes. Uh, it's become a running joke that every time before we start, we're like, okay... We've got some very succinct talking points. This is going to be a really quick, like, 45, 50-minute episode. Turns out two hours long. Uh, non-stop. Yes. <laughs> it, it seems like so little things when we put it together in a bulleted list. It, it seems to be getting smaller and smaller, but nope. We just keep talking. <laughs> I also wanted to mention before we kick things off today, I super appreciated all of those Zelda comments and theories I'm just eating them up because it is just so much fun to pontificate and just BS about whatever the Breath of the Wild 2 is going to be about. So if you got opinions, I want to hear them. I, I, I got opinions, but I'm not allowed to share them, apparently. Yeah, Galen doesn't, uh, he's not a part of the party. <laughs> so let's talk about some recent games we've been playing this week on our Adventure Log. Adventure Log! <laughs> So Galen, with that very lovely musical introduction to the adventure log that you just gave us, you've been playing some kind of musical lately yourself, haven't you? You've yeah. been playing Cadence yeah. of Haidaru? Yeah, um, 
I finally got a little bit more playtime in with it, and I feel like I've gotten over the learning curve of the game. Mm. Uh, it definitely was very interesting to start off with. Thinking along with the beats that they were playing and not just wanting to see the opportunity dash in and make the attack, uh, attacks, which often got me killed quite a few times. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, no, the game is a lot of fun. It's definitely a very unique game. I have not played anything like this before. Uh, but I say that in a good way because it was very refreshing. It's weird because it actually has a lot of elements that you would find in a roguelike series, such as every time you lose all of your hearts and you end up dying, you go back to like a hub, like Spirit World or whatever, and you get the chance to buy various items to help you for your next playthrough through the game. Uh, those ones are only temporary, and it's kind of a thing of how far can I get on this playthrough with the materials that I'm getting. What usually comes along with those roguelike things are the procedural generated dungeons. That is definitely not the case in this game, or at least not that I've found so far. So hmm. it's an interesting way to bring some of those features into the game. I actually had uh, a friend of mine come over and we were playing co-op on it. And even when we started a brand new file at, in a co-op setting, map was the exact same. Who is this friend? <laughs> uh, this friend is a family member, so... <laughs> I'll allow it. Alright. <laughs> it, it's weird. You're giving me, like, judgy eyes. Doing this live is, like, weird. <laughs> you finally get to see how... Harshly, I'm judging you all the time behind the screen. Usually, I could like tell just by the tone of your voice, but seeing it in person, I mean, it it brings back memories. <laughs> <laughs> so so far, you're enjoying the game, yeah. You're enjoying your. Uh, it's a bit more of a, a premium indie price at twenty five U S dollars. So you're, you're so far saying it's worth it. Yeah, I would probably say that it's worth it. Um, it's worth it just for the refreshing experience that goes along with it. Um, I'm sure that the uh, Legend of Zelda uh, name tag adds on a little bit of a pretty penny, but to be honest... Five dollars to be exact. Exactly. Uh, to be honest, though, it seems to fit pretty well with the theme. Like, this is a very good blending of both the uh, like Link to the Past style of Zelda with uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer gameplay. Mm -hmm. So... Have you tried out Zelda yet, or have you only done Link? Uh, I've only Geek. done. <laughs> I've only done Link on both times, so mm. yeah. Do you hate women? What's what's the story there? Uh, it was honestly I went with Link the very first time, and then I gave my co-op partner the choice, and she chose to go with uh, Link. So that one was out of my hands on this one. Ah, I see. I'm just kidding. We all know Zelda is the guy. <laughs> what if Zelda were a girl? I'm still trying to figure out why I can't Metroid crawl. You just, you take the the wind right out of the sails. You're a wind waker <laughs> with your lame jokes. Just taking it all out. If I'm taking the wind out of the sails, wouldn't that be a wind sleeper? Again, see what you've done? You just did it again. Sweet Jesus. So as for me, I have been playing some... Final Fantasy VII. Oh, the 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 one with the the, the sweet graphics and the, the excellent gameplay and I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> Been playing the the Final Fantasy VII. I don't know remaster. I suppose it is on the Nintendo Switch. It was on sale recently. Picked that up. Played it on the plane. It's been a while since I have played this game. I want to say. Mm, maybe seven or eight years mm -hmm. and I've replayed it several times but especially just being older and kind of analyzing video games a little bit differently in my older age I forgot how well paced the beginning of this game is really yeah so so far I am in the Shinra building for those of you familiar with it so quite a few hours into the game met several different characters it's just so excellently paced where you meet a character, you go to a dungeon, 
you hit a story beat that takes you to a new character and then to a different dungeon and another story beat and meanwhile those separate story beats are all coming in together and intertwining and some of the characters are intertwining too and they give you just enough freedom but also restrict you in just the right ways where you're like oh i want to know more i want to see more mm -hmm. and tons of great set pieces too where it's like okay this big robot comes crashing into your plans and then interrupts you and teaches you about um, pincer battles and then also it explodes and then you get separated from your team and then you meet a new team member and you fall into like a bed of flowers in a brand new part of the slums and then later on like you're fighting in an elevator by this like helicopter enemy and it shoots the windows off the elevator because it's like an outside elevator of of like a building so it's okay. you're basically outside with a big thick glass it shoots that off you're fighting each other as you're descending the elevator <laughs> um lots of great things i can't believe how well and how ambitious wait hold on that's two totally separate sentences i can't believe how ambitious this game was for a 1997 rpg on new hardware mm -hmm. and i can't believe how whole jesus i can't believe how well it holds up that's the words i was going for <laughs> Considering how old and early on this was in the timeline of the PS1. Well, I was going to ask how you feel going back to this game after playing, or not playing it for seven years, but you very obviously seem very animated about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Galen can see me throwing my hands around and everywhere. That's what I do. That's how I live this life. Mm -hmm. he, he talks with not only both of his hands, but sometimes his foot at the same time. Explain that. Uh, I have seen you stand on one foot while talking about something and flail both your other leg and your hands all at the same time because you were so excited. Yep. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> this is correct. Yep. So, playing the remake, or playing... What, why this is going to happen several times. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm just going to call it the original, even though it's a remaster. There you go, I'm just do that. call it the original. It's barely a remaster, too. It's barely that. Playing the original, does this make you more or less excited for the remake that's been going to be coming around, knowing how drastically different uh, they are changing the game in the way of like how the game plays in battle and things like that? So it doesn't make my excitement change for the remake in any way. It does, however, make me feel more at ease about if that remake is a big old piece of crap. Mm. Because I I knew Final Fantasy VII was good, but again, I haven't played it in seven or eight years. So I, you just kind of forget to what degree, and already it's it's really comforting. I'm like, oh, this is really good. This is still a good experience. Like, honestly, this game didn't need to get remade or anything like that. I really don't think so, but I'm also not one who shouts for remakes or anything like that. So... I don't know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think it does. I yeah. think it does. So, speaking of remakes and playing the game again, uh, it's the way you were talking about it, you were talking a lot about the uh, theatrics of it and, like, riding down an elevator while fighting a boss or a helicopter and things like that. Um, it's nonstop, like, one after another, too. It's really impressive for how early that game was mm -hmm. and i know you haven't played you just said just like you haven't played it for like seven years or so but having played the game before in the past do you find the story as captivating as before oh so that's a really interesting point and i forgot to mention this i'm playing this game in japanese so i'm having a bit of a different experience with this game's story than i did when i was younger or many years ago hmm Final Fantasy VII is kind of known as having a not great translation. It's not awful by any means. There's a couple of parts where it's like, whoa, someone fell asleep on the keyboard at this moment. But ultimately speaking, it does get things through, but there are lots of different nuances that I do notice as a translator myself that get lost or I would have changed or whatever. So I'm playing this in Japanese. My impression of characters sometimes varies from what I experienced before so I always thought Aerith was really annoying and just kind of in the way and like a tag-along kind of character mm -hmm. in the English original I'm playing it in Japanese 
she's much more charming and also a little bit funny. Really? Yeah, yeah. I like huh. her a whole lot more as I'm playing through it in Japanese. It's it's interesting that the language barrier would actually have a little bit of a um, like a character development difference between the two. Yeah, that's part of the the fascinating thing with the written Japanese language too. In written Japanese, you can change so so many things to express a person's type of personality. For example, one aspect of this is pronouns in Japanese. There are a bajillion different pronouns that you can use, rather than like, I, me, and that's it <laughs> in English. Uh, in Japanese, the pronoun that the person uses helps to sort of convey what kind of character they are. There's also sentence ending particles that express emotion. And English has its own way of expressing emotion as well, but it's not as, I guess, easy to write that yeah. in, in Japanese versus English. You can still totally get that across. It's not like it's impossible or something, but I know that, especially back in those days, those translations would be done under a very tight frame, tight time frame, and without as much support. So I guess this begs another question that I have for you. Beg! With the, I'm gonna call it the remake this time, coming around the corner. I mean, it's coming out next year. Yeah. Do you think that the developers are going to rewrite the characters to closely resemble one interpretation over the other? Like, do you think they're going to try to make those character changes? The developers, no. The translators, yes. I think the translators are gonna have more support, more time probably, and just more tools in their hands to make a more accurate translation mm -hmm. of the characters yeah. for the West. Well, and I feel like something as big as Final Fantasy VII is going to be almost a very dangerous game to remake because you're talking... We are already seeing it, yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a big old titty com controversy. <laughs> Listen, it's the dumbest thing. You only want to make sure you bring the bust facts of any game, so. Right, yeah, the bust <laughs> facts. Uh, just the titties, ma'am. Isn't that just the facts, ma'am? Isn't that a thing? I think so. Oh my god. Our audience is like 18 and, and under. <laughs> this is a joke for people who are 50 and older. Like that one cool dude. I forgot his name off the top of my head. I feel like it was a really simple name, like Chris. That one cool dude that sent in stuff about and he's playing Pokemon. Oh, playing Pokemon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. What up, dude? How hey, you doing? How you doing, man? I hope you're still listening. <laughs> so let's use this as a segue and let's jump into the news and let's talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake because we're going to be talking about all the other things that we hadn't really talked about at E3. Let's talk about Tifa's boobies. Puff, puff. <laughs> Kicking things off, let's make a quick mention of this, because if people are already upset that I'm talking about Tifa's boobs and they're ready to close this out, we gotta explain ourselves here. I mean, it's really just a small controversy, so... Not... <laughs> not bad. That was a better one. The lovely listeners at home, you be the judge of whether he gets better at this throughout the episode or not. Surveys are in the mail. Please make sure that you Stop. fill it out. Stop! Stop! <laughs> there was some statements in Japanese and then it was mistranslated about Tifa's boobs where they said that they that Sony's ethics department wanted them to be restricted or something like that. That's a poor translation. I retweeted a great thing. Follow me on Twitter, by the way, because I retweet some great stuff. I don't have a lot to say or good content on my own, but I do find other people who are way cooler and I show you way cooler people. So, so basically the spirit of what Twitter is. So. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so anyway, that was a bad translation. This other guy put out a much better translation that I highly endorse. Basically, they were saying that they just want her boobs to make sense in the situation. So if she's a big old brawler and she's jumping around and punching people, like, her boobs situation needs to make sense. So the guy explained, the designer explained that he put, like, a sports bra on her underneath her, like, white tank top. So she didn't just have a white tank top from before. That makes sense for yeah. girls jumping around. She's still got a big old titty. If you look at those <laughs> screenshots, she got a big old booty. 
compare, and this is where it's ridiculous, is where some people are like, oh, she's down to a B cup, and da, 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 like, whatever. That does not make sense. Compare her hand to the size of that boobie. If her hand can't hold one boob, that means that it is bigger. Also, I am a gay man. I'm talking about boobs. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, bigger than D for sure. Galen just grabbed his own boobs <laughs> to check his own cup size. And also for lumps, probably. Anyway, she's still got big old boobs. Like, shut up, all you people talking about. Like, if you really care about this and you're really upset about it, you are absolutely stupid. Honestly, when I saw the uh, the images and everything like that, I didn't even think that that was, like, a factor or anything like that. I heard and... people whining about the, getting upset before anything even existed before. So my eyes were already on those boobs when she was revealed at E3. Actually, I saw her before the reveal at E3 because I was up in that business before E3 started. And I saw her and I was like, oh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm really surprised that this was even a thing to begin with. Oh my because... god, if people can get angry on the internet about something stupid, they will. Exactly. They will. But, I mean, we're talking about a complete re her overhaul and redesign of all the characters so they look natural. They look real. They look like how they looked in, like, let's say, Advent Children. I mean, can you remember when that first came out and everybody's minds were blown by how realistic these characters were looking? Yeah. Well, yeah. and it's because they don't have, you know, like, basketball hands that they're walking around with pointing. You know? <laughs> yeah, they redid Cloud's hair in Advent Children in particular because it just made sense. It was yeah. a big old, huge, freaky, spiky thing. If you ever saw a cosplay pre-Advent Children of Cloud, People have the dumbest things going on with their wigs. Right? So, the boobs are fine. Enjoy the boobs. The boobs are totally fine. <laughs> I know that there's a big old controversy with Sony censoring things and pushing censorship. I get it. I don't like censorship myself. But this is not the hill to die on. There's lots of other hills. Booby-shaped hills to die on. Bigger than Tifa's See, boobs. I was about to say, Tifa has some pretty, pretty good hills that, you know, I feel really, like, weird talking about this. <laughs> Why? You, because you're looking into my eyes and talking about boobs? Yeah, this is, a, this is weird. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Now that we've talked about that, Mishigas, let's move on to the actual stuff that we really need to talk about with the remake. You saw the trailer, right, of uh, Final Fantasy VII at E3? Yes. Okay, so what did you think about Both what you were seeing? Both of them. Uh, I watched the one where they announced the actual date of it, where it was during the, I think it was a Final Fantasy Orchestra concert. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On. It was like the day before or whatever. And then the one that they actually brought, uh, the Square brought with them to their conference. I think, it, I mean, the game looks great. And I'm saying this as person who has actually never beaten Final Fantasy VII before. Loser! I know. Uh, it's I'm um, just just take my take my fake gamer card right here. I printed it out. I got it in the back of a NOS. Like a NOS fuel energy drink. Or that true? I don't know what that means. It's really weird when I give you my bag jokes. They don't work. I can see the face of you like not realizing that they're bad. Jokes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talk about on your Marvel card. What is what is the stats on the back of it? That's what I want to hear about. Uh, it has a lot of strength, not so much intelligence. Decent charisma. I'm surprised by that one. Yeah, yeah. Me too. <laughs> I think everybody is. Yes. <laughs> um, back to the trailer. Uh, the game got me excited. And I'm excited to play this for the first time as... I don't know if I am excited to be playing this version for the first time or if I should go back and play the original beforehand. Like, Do go back and play the original beforehand. That's my recommendation. Well, and I feel like this is almost a situation of like, okay, this movie just came out that's based on a book. Do I read the book before I see the movie or do I see the movie and then I go and read the book? Like, both should happen so I have like it on both sides, but... Is there a chance that doing one before the other would ruin my experience for it? I mean, we don't know because we don't know what the quality of the remake is going to be. The trailer looks absolutely stunning. Square Enix are masters of making trailers. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, they are not masters in the modern era of making video games because their quality has been all over the map. Mm -hmm. So that is why I am 
cautiously optimistic for this game. I do appreciate that they did put in that boss battle at the end, though, to be able to kind of show a more in-depth thing on how the combat is going to work and how... Because it is a very different combat system compared to the original. It sounds really cool, mm -hmm. too. I'm definitely cautiously optimistic about that. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people relate it to a cross between like Final Fantasy XV's combat and something like Kingdom Hearts, which... I mean, I can, I can see where they're coming from when they say that. Yeah, as long as it doesn't get like ridiculous combo heavy and just dumb like Kingdom Hearts 2 did, never played 3, mm -hmm. then I'm cool with it, but I don't see there's these are the cautiously optimistic things. Yeah. Because all that stuff looks really cool in Kingdom Hearts 2 and 3 and whatever, but it's like, how does it play? Does it feel like garbage? Because from what I've heard, I haven't played 15 yet, from what I've heard about 15, you can just hold down that attack button and they do all these cool moves, but it's not all that interactive and it's not all that engaging for a lot of players. Not all, but a lot yeah. of players. Because yeah. all around that game was kind of contentious. I do like the bit during the trailer when they were first showing off the combat and they emphasized that part where you could go into the slow-mo mode. Yeah, the ATV actually, thing. Yeah, the ATV, or AB, is it ABS? ATB, right? Yeah, active time battle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What? I think I got confused with ATV, and I thought that is definitely not it, and that's yes. why I like restructured my diet process. Galen's talking about his abs, everybody. <laughs> hey, I'm still <laughs> show him your abs, Galen. <laughs> hey, I'm still stuck on last week's episode where I was wrong for like the entire thing. So, <laughs> God, I last episode or the one before that or the one before that, it's a it's a smoothie of wrong. Yeah, but I still have a medium in charisma. <laughs> Go on, please. Anyway, uh, I I got a kick out of the going into that slow mo feature with the ATS system. AT, I did, oh, I did it again. ATB. He's wrong on this episode, <laughs> folks. See. <laughs> I liked how they went into the slow mo. He likes the Matrix. And the announce or the guy who was talking about it got oh my god, really he's the worst. And animated is like, look how cool this is. And I was just kind of sitting there going, okay, it's like pausing and going into that cinematic mode that nobody actually uses in modern video games nowadays. I could not stand him. And on that note, general E3 um, impressions for me, the people presenting were obnoxious like almost the entire time i just couldn't it was either the crowd or it was either the presenters and i just only could like skip through things and watch highlights of so many conferences well and i feel like that might be part of the reason why some of the companies are starting to go to more of a like a nintendo direct-esque format with i totally agree presenting, so. yes because you can't flub that up it's all pre-recorded yeah Let's talk about that in a second, though. I want to keep talking about Final Fantasy okay, okay, Remake, okay. though. Sorry. I've got words on that one. Me too, so. me too. That's my fault. I'm screwing it all up. But I'm, I'm steering this ship. It's got a hole in the hull. And we're, <laughs> we got to swab this poop deck. So, let me talk a bit about why I am cautious about this game. We have only seen, like, the opening fifth of that game. It's all Midgar stuff only for the remake. And I think we do have confirmation that it is still being released in parts. Yeah. That's why it's still being, or that's why it's being released next year. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, oh, cool, it's kind of soon. That's because, like, a fifth of the game is only done. And yeah. there are a lot of thoughts that I have on that. From what I heard, they're not even sure how many parts they're going to have yet. That worries me. Yeah, me too. And so I have lots of concerns where it's like, all right, this game is releasing in the latter half of the PS4 life cycle, right? Mm -hmm. That means that there's going to be more parts releasing. Is it going to be expanding, expanding, spanning across the PS4 and the PS5? And then they're going to get re-releases on the PS5 of the earlier parts. And it's going to be a mess, I think. I just can't see how this won't be a mess for them. I hope it isn't. I, I want to be as optimistic as possible, but Modern Square has given me lots of reasons to worry. That That is a, that is a legitimate concern. Um, I am not concerned about that as much because going into this and planning for cross-save compatibility, being able to bring over your information from like the PS4 generation to the PS4 or the PS5 generation, that's okay. Like, I'm... 
if they do it correctly and they plan for it, it should not be an issue. What I am worried about, though, is the f what are they charging for this game? When oh, 60 out? plus more for a special edition and DLC and a whole bunch of plastic BS. Well, and that's what I was seeing. Like, yes. I, I know that they have their, like, collector's edition where it's a squ squall. Oh my god, wrong game. Um, Fake gamer! <laughs> Fake gamer! <laughs> Where, where it's cloud on its motorcycle and that like collector's edition is like i don't know 200 300 dollars or something like that psa don't buy that yeah. don't buy that garbage stop it seriously um but even if it was 60 dollars for the game and that's what they come out with well if it's going to be five chapters and again that's just that five thing this is just a number that i kind of threw out so whatever yeah. You have to you have to consider that you're going to be paying that for basically every chapter that comes out. So if let's say for example, Tony was right and it is five chapters. I mean, that is $300 that you're paying for to get the entire experience of a a what's it 22 year old game? 97? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But I mean, even if it's three chapters, still it's 60, 60, 60, mm -hmm. right? Plus any DLC nonsense, because they're going to do that for sure. They they have this cow that they can milk only once, the, the Final Fantasy cow. Exactly. Final Fantasy VII cow. Exactly. So they're going to be doing that. And that sounds like a huge mess to me. And when you talked about cross-save and bringing your stuff over, that brings up another issue for me. What if... It brings over your levels. Is there any kind of level cap or something like that? Because say I enjoy playing this game and and it's going to be only a short portion, so I just want to keep playing because I'm grinding or whatever. Am I suddenly over leveled when part two comes out because there's been so much time between part one and part two, and then suddenly part two is all screwed up for me no. because I over leveled? You know what I mean? No, that act that absolutely makes sense. There's a whole bunch of like concerns that I have that I really don't think that Square is capable of addressing or has the foresight. Wait, foresight? What was that word you used a long time ago? Foreknowledge! Foreknowledge. Yes. <laughs> uh, to to do it the right way, which who knows is the right way because this is new ground, right? Absolutely it is. That level cap is a... I don't know. I, that's a really good See? point. See? See? Yeah. No, that that is an excellent point and something I didn't even consider when I was thinking about it. So, it, I just thought of it when you were talking about this, the, just now bringing things over. I'm like, oh, that's right, because you're only playing through, let's let's be optimistic here and say one third of the game. Mm -hmm. It's weird because the only other game that I've seen that has done a similar style as what they are doing with Final Fantasy was the Metal Gear Solid game. When they came out with Metal Gear Solid Five, they did Ground Zero beforehand, which was basically a tech demo for their game. They sold it for, I think it was $40 when it first came out because they realized, hey, it's not the actual thing, but this will tide you over and let you know what's going on. I was a sucker and ended up buying it. And You are a sucker. Yeah, and I'm really into No Gear Solid. Like, Kojima, I will give you your money. Not Konami, just Kojima. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember it not working out too well and it left a sour taste in a lot of fans mouths because they wanted that full experience and even when they got the full game everything they did previously didn't like really carry over or even matter all too much and considering that they are taking a almost like a telltales slash life is strange episodic approach to this the story is definitely going to matter between the two but yeah you're 100 percent right that gameplay and like leveling up your character because there are some people who love to level grind on those games yeah say the combat system is really good and you're like god i just i love this game and i love these characters there's another two years before another part comes out mm -hmm. i'm just gonna keep playing this a little bit more yeah I, I mean i've done that in video games once or twice before i can understand why you are definitely cautiously optimistic on this so without being too much of a downer on that stuff <laughs> i did want to talk about some things that i really liked in the trailer that i saw what I'm most excited about with this remake is not so much the battle system, even though that is looking cool. I'm really excited for just the extra characterization we're going to get, the extra world building, and hopefully it's a world building that has substance on like some of the other games in the Final Fantasy VII world, like Dirge of Cerberus or whatever. Yeah. I, I really hope that it, 
it's something that makes me want to keep exploring Midgar and other towns in the year 2045 when this is finally done. <laughs> For example, I I had a little a little heartache when I saw the scene in the Seventh Heaven Bar where Tifa and Cloud meet for the first time since uh, after school and they're sitting like a, a chair away which is like three or four human lengths away from each other alone at Tifa's bar and it's little moments like that where they added that extra distance and I mean that's super on the nose where it's like there's distance between these characters. There's also physical distance. You know what I mean? But you know what? I don't care. I loved it. I loved it. And I just feel for Tifa so much. I love her. Can you tell how subtle I am being here? Yeah, subtlety <laughs> is kind of not Square's bag at the moment. But you know what? It's fine. Yeah. At this moment, it's fine. I'm, I'm really giving him a pass on a lot of stuff. So moments like that, I'm really looking forward to. And I also really appreciate that they are... With how iconic of a character that Cloud is during this remake, and knowing that he is this iconic character, they're not putting all of the spotlight and the attention on him. Like, I love how much of the trailer they actually devoted to showing uh, Barrett's personality. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, like, his daughter and showing up, and, like, him kind of talking him to the group and everything. Like, I appreciated that. I liked that. Yeah, I guess we should sort of talk about the... Barrett voice controversy because he sounds <laughs> Galen just made a, vo a face at me like the oh, the what? <laughs> um, yeah, the so people were saying how his voice is kind of ridiculous and over the top. However, I always thought that Barrett was just a very ridiculous and over the top kind of character. Mm -hmm. Um, this one hasn't been that much of a controversy. It was more so like a couple of weeks, weeks, months ago when Barrett. Um, was first revealed in a trailer well before E3. And, you know, he's got kind of a Mr. T vibe to him, but I always anticipated him, anticipated, interpreted him as that. If you're looking at characters in Final Fantasy that are... Erratic, exaggerated? Exaggerated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to refer you to... Kate Sith! Uh, I was actually going to say uh, Zaz from Final Fantasy XIII. Oh, Saz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I loved how he has a little chocobo chick living in his afro. <laughs> so, but that's my argument right there. Just like, boom. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I can understand the sort of stereotypical um, complaints about him. Uh, I just, I don't feel one way or another about it. I thought when I heard his voice that it fit his character that I've always had in my head. However, if you have, you know, complaints about the stereotype of, of him just sounding like such an American black guy, I, I get it. But, um, yeah. Well, and this is kind of what I was talking about beforehand on how dangerous of a game Final Fantasy VII is when it comes to remaking it. Because... Watch yourself! You're now going against that nostalgia aspect. Show me what you're working with! Do you change the character to better fit the times of when the game is re-relaunching? Or do you keep to the spirit of the characters when they originally came out? Well, honestly, I feel like it really does hit the spirit of the character... So that that's why it's weird for me. Yeah. So far, they haven't seemed to be doing many like redesigns in terms of character personalities or even like physical redesigns either. They've been updating them, but they're really fam familiar. Uh, not familiar. What's the word? Come on, Oni. <laughs> Faithful. Yes. To their original designs. See, it always starts with the first letter or the first <laughs> sound of whatever wrong word I just said. It always starts. Jesus. How does my brain work that way? I don't know, but it was interesting to watch. <laughs> so let's move on to some general E3 stuff. We sort of touched on this before. They had garbage crowds at all of the live conferences, mm -hmm. and it was really unprofessional. There were just shouters and hecklers. That was why I couldn't sit through any of the press conferences the whole way through yeah. this past week. I had to skip through a whole bunch of it, you said you got opinions about video games, Galen. Why don't you tell me them opinions? <laughs> so I feel like I have been a longtime admirer of the event that is E3. Um, I remember back when I got my original PlayStation and I subscribed to the unofficial PlayStation magazine. I remember that unofficial bit was very important. Yes. 
Um, it was cruder. The, the first time that I even heard about E3 was through this, and this idea of this one special time of the year when all of the game companies would come together and they would show the latest and greatest games, and there would be you know people in costumes, and it just sounded like so much fun. And I have always, always, always wanted to actually experience going to that convention. That said, I feel like the spirit of E3 has really kind of changed. I feel like a lot of it is not so much about the celebration of games, it's more of the pat on the back, shaking of hands, yes. and I'm other unmentionable gestures that people can do <laughs> to themselves oh, okay, okay. when it comes to these conferences. Like, Picking your nose. Yeah, let's go with that one. <laughs> um, Washing your hands. Bethesda Bethesda was the worst. The, was the worst of all of them. Yes, it. Todd Coward has become lovably obnoxious, and now he's just purely gross. Yeah. Well, and uh, I hated how the entire they spent time in the conference to play this elaborate video where they're going over a bunch of their program as programmers and artists and everybody's talking about how dedicated they are to the company and how much they want to make games just for you and how thankful they are i and hate like, that what are you doing you're basically just saying hey please we know we effed up but we're bethesda we're trying really hard right they did that three times yeah they did the oh but we're cute guys i uh -huh. hate that so much and also i want to say on that note of what they were trying to bring off is I do not want to play a game that somebody made for me. I want to play a game that somebody made because they had a vision or they had an idea mm -hmm. and they created it themselves. I'll play it and see if it's for me or not. I'll decide. Yeah. Yeah. That Like, that's dumb. I want to play art. And you know what? Wanting to make games for fans, wanting to keep on, you know, legacies such as like the Elder Scrolls game. There's a lot of people who love those games. They say that they are their favorite RPGs of all time, and they're really passionate. And they know the responsibility that comes along with making a new game in this in the series. You know, they don't want to be known as I'm going to switch companies here, but. They don't want to be known as the guy who wrote the story for Mass Effect 3. Okay. Yeah. Like, I'm on board. Compared to, like, the first two games and how good the story was there. Like, it, it's completely understandable and completely acceptable to want to take passion and pride in what you're doing. But when you are force-feeding that down uh, the consumer's throats and almost guilting them to a sense of, like... Well, look at how hard these guys are trying. I know they really, the game really sucked, but you know, they're they're doing their best, right? The the stupid thing and the honestly the shitty thing about that mentality too is that none of these industries are unionized in terms of job security for all of these people they're trying to prop up. Mm -hmm. This is just a PR stunt to make their corporation look really friendly and kind and make you want to give them your money for their products. All of those developers don't have a leg to stand on when the project ends and they need to cut staff. That happens all the time. We've seen lots of it happening in the last couple of years. Yeah. Industry crunch is a big thing these days. It just is so disingenuous and it makes me want to give them my money even less. Exactly. I feel like a majority of these press conferences that are out there are just PR starts or er, stunts. <laughs> <laughs> PR starting stumps. They're PR startups. They are kickstarting PR. No. They're <laughs> starting a fire and farting their parts. Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, take Microsoft, for example. Microsoft, I feel, had a tremendous advantage this year because Sony didn't decide to show up. They weren't going to show any of their games. The Microsoft platform had a great opportunity to be able to go ahead and show some of the games that were coming out and relate it to that Microsoft and that Xbox name. Like, there was a, there was a new game that they were talking about called Spiritfarer. And I, I think Is I'm, that one word? 
Uh, it's either one word or two. Are you talking about fairer? Like fairer, as in yeah. how one fares. Yes. And it's one word, spirit fairer? I think so. I hate that trend in video game titles. <laughs> Skyrim. Shadowbringer. Butt farts. <laughs> like, just all of them are one word and they all look two stupid. Two syllables. Yeah, two syllables and, and two words and combined together. It's catchy. Stuff. Rolls off the tongue. Come on. A spirit fairer <laughs> does not roll off the tongue. No, it doesn't. There's <laughs> way too many rrrr in there. It's like talking about George R.R. Martin. <laughs> but the game actually looked very interesting, and I got this weird vibe of like, hey, this is kind of like Animal Crossing just with this different art artistic aesthetic in, you know, an action platforming elements to it, too. I mean, the game looked interesting. I wanted to know more about it, and I was sad that that was coming out for Microsoft, but it made me relate that game to Microsoft. I am fortunately was happy to find out that it's also coming out for the Switch as well, as well as the PS4. That was what I was really excited about with Microsoft Conference, actually. Right, it's finding out what games are coming out for other ones. And yeah. <laughs> Microsoft could have, quote-unquote, stolen the show by having all of these different titles coming out and had that, like, their conference could have been amazing. What they did instead, though, was they decided to bring out Keanu Reeves for a game that's not even Microsoft exclusive. Granted, that was really cool to see, but it was a PR stunt. Yeah, yeah. They were talking about their Forza game, their new Forza one, and they're bringing out Lego cars into it, which I guess is kind of a play on a previous one that they did where they're bringing, like, the Hot Wheels brand, and it was Hot Wheel cars that you could play as in the Forza game, so... It's kind of like a more light-hearted take on a serious racer. I'm taking a nap as you're speaking. Exactly. But <laughs> when they announced the game, they showed like maybe 15 to 30 seconds of gameplay, and then they brought out an actual Lego Ferrari. Like a Ferrari that was built of Legos. And I, I was sitting here, I was like, why? It's not a Microsoft conference unless there's a car on stage. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> And I'm remembering E3 last year. Once again, I'm going to Bethesda. They were talking about their new game, or their new, I think it was Rage. And right when they were about to announce it, they decided to have a music concert. Just randomly thrown in there. And it was like, I feel like this is becoming less and less about wanting to show off the cool games and more about the games being a slight foundation but all the icing all the flavoring all the spices that go into it is all just this it's all flash and no substance yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's part of why as a whole with like triple a gaming and the biggest publishers i'm becoming very disenfranchised it's all mm -hmm. just disingenuous and it's really showing how the big business side of this industry has become in such a short amount of time. It's going through not only growing pains, but it's kind of getting too big for what it's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, that's, that's really vague of me to say, but I just... It's becoming, like you said, more flash and more about what product they're selling as opposed to the product that they're making. Exactly. So that's why I really turn to a lot of things like Devolver Digital's conference mm -hmm. and Nintendo's conference. Well, and that's another thing, and I'm glad that you brought that up. So, the three of the best conferences that I felt they had this year was Nintendo, obviously. I think they had the best one of the show. Square was a very close second, but I think third was actually Devolver Digitals. Because yeah. they brought an element of humor to it. Where they were, they flat out like mocked the entire conference. But they, they mocked the industry, and exactly. I'm like, yes, high fiving a million Nina Struthers right now. Exactly, I but love that woman. It. They got it. Um, but I made the, I've been making this connection that over the past couple of years, this direct esque way of announcing games, where you take out the live audience. Yeah, the get rid of those POSs that are shouting in the freaking audience that are so unprofessional. Hi, I'm a developer, Carl Carl. Take my money! <laughs> oh, you're, you're spiking all over the place. <laughs> but yes, they are like walruses sitting in a in a in an audience. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, I'm so glad you got that. Some uh, people don't get that. But no, I mean, take out the flash. Take out all of the 
the the hype men in the front rows and who... make it fun exactly like devolver digital with that tentacle shooting out of that guy's stomach like yes <laughs> yes please more more monsters and I... tentacles yes to tentacles okay i need that platform in video games exactly i i feel like that is a much more successful model for conveying what new games are coming out and much more faithful to the, wanting to actually get excited more than trying to uh, keep yourself reserved because you know you're being sold something. And sort of on that note, I thought that Microsoft's... I, I thought Microsoft this year was going to be better than, than they ultimately were. I didn't think they were bad, but Project Scarlet, when they announced that, that oh video was awful. The video was awful, and they didn't even show the console. They gave no information. I'm sorry. That bit that they talked about is like, oh, well, we've got so many teraflops processing. And it's like, no, that means nothing. Yes, exactly. That means absolutely nothing. And even if you are computer literate to the point where you are building computers, there is a very slim chance that any of that mm. means absolutely nothing whatsoever. Yeah. They are fancy words. They are flashy words. Exactly. Again, that's coming back up. And it's just meant to sound super impressive, and they can't show you anything. We saw no footage, we saw no physical hardware announcement. It was it was so lackluster, and I'm sorry, I don't give a crap about Scarlet. Yeah, yeah. I think that they did it probably a little bit too soon, because, I mean, they announced it a year and a half early, taking the wind out of any possible sales... Wait, I... Oh... I screwed that up in, in words. They're, they're, Taking the possible sales wins. Wait, this is getting worse. They're, they're uh, trying to get ahead of, like, Sony, for example. They and... are, but, like, they're, whatever sales momentum they currently have, that's mm -hmm. better. Um, I... Wait, not I. Microsoft. Oh, God, it's getting worse again. <laughs> whatever sales momentum the Xbox One X and the One have now, they're kind of taking that out, and everybody's waiting for 2020. Yeah. The end holiday of 2020 for Microsoft's new console. And it's like, I mean, good luck, but I think that they did it kind of early. Also, going back to the video for Scarlet, like you said, it meant nothing. They, they just had these fake interviews with, like, fake developers saying, like... I, <laughs> I love the person who just sat there and was like, loading times, am I right? I know! I <laughs> hated that what? so much! It came off as so disingenuous and, like, <gasps> just gross. Um, but they, like, they had, like, that one girl who was like, this is gonna be the most awesome, immersive console ever. And it's like, this doesn't actually mean anything! You're just trying to drum up hype and get, like, losers, like, the people in your freaking audience that just want to be excited so then they throw you money in the moment. I... You're trying to get that. I am not immersed in a game by how many teraflops the system can actually pump out. Yeah, I'm immersed in a game based on the gameplay, the story, and how engaging it actually is. It's all about the substance of the game itself, not the flash of the system. Also, they're talking about like 8K and 120 frames per second. Like, I'll believe that when I see it in two console generations from now, not one. You know what I mean? I'm... We can't even get a stable 1080 60 out of this console generation. How do you think next one's going to be? 8 and 120. I, I was about to say, I'm not going to see it anytime soon because no. I don't even have an 8K TV. So. Exactly! <laughs> most most people don't even have a 4K TV. Not many manufacturers even make an 8K TV. Right. It's, it's They want to get ahead of the technology curve and just say, hey, look how fancy our stuff is. And here's the thing. It was really underwhelming. 4K and 8K resolution means absolutely nothing. It is how many pixels they can put into the screen based on the size itself. So, yes, you can get more definition in the screen, but depending on the screen size, that might not matter at all. Yeah. That's why 720 on the Switch's um, handheld screen, not a bad compromise because it's no. such a small screen. If it were 1080, that'd be nice and you'd probably see some, some decent jump in quality but it's not necessary a lot of the times and people say this about uh comparison videos they'll be like you know on the screen you're kind of missing something here in the switch version but on that small screen you don't notice it at all that kind of thing uh, speaking of those comparison videos I i've been noticing a lot of the time when they are like here's the ps pro ver or ps4 pro versus the xbox one x versus the regular xbox one 
half the time I can't even tell what the difference is. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, and I, I'm not entirely sensitive to that kind of stuff, so I'm in the same boat with you. I get that some people want that um, comparison because they're total tech heads, and that's cool, that's your thing, but also sometimes it's just a dick measuring contest between mm -hmm. whatever brand you're pledging allegiance to. By the way, console wars are dumb, and they're only perpetuated by people who are dumb, so knock that off. So, speaking of console wars, I guess this should segue into the possible elimination of consoles with how many developers are focusing on cloud streaming. Uh, they're not going to eliminate consoles, but yes, the whole cloud streaming and buy our monthly service thing was just as much of a motif this year at E3 mm -hmm. as shooters were a motif at E3 this year. My god, am I, I'm not somebody who plays shooters, but... Like, every damn game was a damn shooter this year, and a, a live service, and a roadmap kind of game, and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I don't believe any of this. I feel like a lot of the time, the people who are focusing on these kind of announcements and these kind of events, and are also swayed by the opinions of them, yeah. fall into the demographic of, I like to play shooters, I yep. like to play racers, I like the flashiest thing... I want to know the newest thing that's coming out, so... And there's such a popularity contest among people with this mentality in gaming as well, where, like, gaming is becoming a... like a fashion show almost kind of thing, where you're trying to... You know, just trying to be popular, or trying to be something like that, and it feels so weird and foreign to me. I made a tweet recently where, like... Because I'm trying to think about, okay, I gotta put something on Twitter today, I gotta put something on Instagram today and take a picture of whatever the hell I'm doing. My god, is that not me? And so I just made an apology post straight up where I was like, I can't I can't do this all the time. Like, I'm not just gonna be, <laughs> not be myself, you know? And I said, like, I'll be outside of a venue shoving a sandwich in my face because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I can't be, like, putting a pretty picture of myself on Instagram pretending that I have, like oh, I woke up like this or whatever. It's it's weird the way that personality things are going in gaming. I, I just like your comment earlier about the, the video game fashion awards or fashion show, and now I just want to kind of go, oh, really? Tell me what Keanu Reeves is playing lately. <laughs> a, a, a likeable... Oh, is that a Gucci controller? <laughs> wow, so <laughs> clearly Galen knows nothing about fashion. I mean, neither do I, but I'm not pretending. Yo, so wait, going back, though, we, we just talked about nine different things in, like, the span of 30 seconds. Oh, but... thanks, these earbuds are Tiffany's. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to get one more joke in. <laughs> oh, God, it, it hurts me. It physically hurts me, and you can see the pain in my brain, in my face. I can. How it hurts. <laughs> I wanted to go back to what baffled me about the E3 crowds, too, is that, like, all these people shouting, like, aren't you supposed to be professionals? Are you supposed to be, like, people there who are working? Like, I don't know about you, but I was at that uh, convention, busting my ass, running around. I didn't have time to sit down at conferences just, you know, because that was my schedule. But also, I'm trying to work while I'm there, and then meanwhile, you know, dude in the back is like, Yeah, take my wallet, or whatever he said. Uh -huh. It's like, God, you people are so... Uh, I don't know. No, I don't it's... know, like, I'm so happy when people are hyped about things. I don't want to be just ragging on things for the sake of it. I... But this is a conference, like... I do have to... And you're supposed to be a professional at an industry event right now. Yeah, and I do have to admit, I'm not going to rule out the thought that these are... Those were plants in the audience. Like... Yeah, that gets a little conspiracy heavy for me, but I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and I mean, it's very easy to... I mean, hey, shut up and take my money, you know, that somebody screaming that from the crowd, that kind of relates that the people who are in the crowd and who are listening to this kind of thing is, oh, I can relate to that person who's over there. God, all of you people who can relate to that guy, just get the F off the planet. <laughs> just, I'll buy you a rocket, get the F off this planet. I don't want to live here anymore. <laughs> So, eliminating the hype and eliminating, you know, I'm going to say this again, Flash, of what a lot of these conferences are doing, going back to the, what a direct style presentation can do for you, do you feel like more, like this is the better way to go about doing their conferences going forward? Do you think we're going to be seeing more of this? 
Like a pre-recorded thing? Yeah, because, I mean, Devolver Digital did it. Um, Sony is doing it right now. They yeah. have their new, what is it, State of Play? Yeah, uh, yeah. Things that they're yeah. doing where it's it's Sony Direct, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nintendo's doing it, and I see this becoming a better trend because, one, you don't have to pay for all of these flashy events that go on. You don't have to pay for Lego cars. And it's a better fan response from it. And I feel like even when people are on stage and playing the game live, there's always that little bit of doubt is, is this really a live game? I see somebody playing a con uh, uh, controller, but I mean, who knows if that's actually a real thing. Yeah, that's one of the biggest pet peeves at E3 for me. That, yeah. That just like, I already know that your enthusiasm is fake, that your speech is fake, that you are fake. I don't know. When they announced the Kinect for the first time and they brought out that little girl to play Connectables. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good know, one. That, that was genuine excitement that I saw there. There's a lot of, especially the last <laughs> generation, they were so guilty of all that stuff so bad. There's a lot of really good compilations on that. But yeah, do, do you think that, you know, we're going to see more companies going to a more direct-esque format? Yeah, I do think so because, I mean, we're seeing it right now as all of those examples you pointed out. I hope so, personally, because then you ignore that annoying fanfare, clearly cl I said clouds also. You said it earlier, now I'm saying it. <laughs> clearly crowds are also getting way worse. Mm -hmm. This planet is ruined, we need a new one. Just set it on fire. And if we have direct style pre-recorded things, then we can just do what I want to see more games more gameplay announcements information mm -hmm. that's what i want to see i don't need people to wow me in a way that i'm not sitting there saying tell me how to think i'm sitting there saying okay show me your product that you've been working on and then i decide for myself yeah you know don't try to create false hype also the hype machine in general is just awful for this industry. And I we say that as two people who run a podcast and talk about what we do and don't like, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't want to say that we contribute to the hype machine, but I think we we contribute to decent discussion of video games. I mean, at the end of the day, we're just two friends having a laugh about video games. Yeah. But I personally like to point out the good and the bad in the industry and how to make a better difference. Exactly. Exactly. Personally, I do think that the, we are going to be seeing more... Uh, companies going over to a direct format. Like, I think that yeah. is a natural evolution and that more people are going to be catching on that it's a lot cheaper. The fact that they have now opened up E3 to the public and anybody can buy a ticket and go and play these newer games, it's becoming more of a regular gaming convention. It's almost taking a little bit of, like, the special, like, sacred feeling from back when i was a kid oh my god i'm gonna slap you i'm gonna reach across the table and slap you you know how i always talk about that i always threaten you you can actually with do it physical now. violence you can actually do it now here i'm gonna slap you right now go ahead there you go <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh old times <laughs> so anyway it's not sacred but i know what you're saying I yeah. know. I, I do get what you're saying. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick by what I was saying because again, I stated this at the beginning of this conversation. I grew up dreaming about one day being able to do this when I was a kid. I'm I gonna slap you again. Go ahead. Uh, I'll give you a six on that one. Oh, okay. I'll work it up to a ten. <laughs> I feel terrible for saying this because it feels like such a like clickbaity thing to say. But I feel like this is the start of the end for the importance of E3. <laughs> no, that, that, that is a, um, that's something that people have been bringing up uh, with this year with Sony's departure. entire, yeah, departure, I guess. Complete absence and perhaps full-on departure. We'll see next year. Mm -hmm. And then everything Microsoft did was off-site, so they weren't on the show floor. Yeah. So that is that is a topic uh, for discussion for sure. I don't think it's going to go away so far 
we are seeing that even though the general public is being allowed into this event, it is still very much an industry event as opposed to something like PAX, yeah. which is very much for the consumer. I hope it doesn't go away from that. And if it does, we're going to see something else popping up for sure. Whether it's a bunch of smaller things or one bigger thing, I don't think it'll be that. But it's really important, I think, as a person in the, in the industry to have a event like this where people are going to network, where people are going to get work done. And I was happy to see so many people running around at the event throughout pre-show, during the show, post-show, that had equipment on their back or they're running around, you know, looking like a mess, myself included, just <laughs> carrying, you know, notebooks and a laptop, running from place to place trying to get their stuff done. I saw a couple of people who were in like cosplay or something. Oh. Clearly they're there for the consumer side of things. Yeah. However, very few people did I see like that, mm -hmm. as opposed to something like PAX where there's lots of people like that around. Yeah. So I kind of hope it has its own distinction as that. I hope so too. I hope so too. Yeah. But I don't know, with the, the past couple conferences that I've been seeing, I'm not as cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where I'm at. Other than being cautious, I don't know if I'm optimistic or not. I'm hopeful. Cautiously hopeful. <laughs> so I guess in last mention, just to to sandwich this whole thing, I just want to mention a couple of things that I really did like um, in general at E3. I thought Ghostwire Tokyo looks really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know very <laughs> no much. No idea what it is. Yeah, I don't know very much about the <laughs> I'm game. excited for but I love the enemy designs. I love the girl that is on the enemy designs. Mm -hmm. I hope that she is allowed to go hog wild. Also, my wife and I agree on that one, that that girl is absolutely adorable. I love her so much. <laughs> I was so sad when I didn't get to like run into her at the show, because I was running around everywhere. I also didn't get to play the Final Fantasy VII remake demo. Don't know if I've complained about that enough on the damn show, but... <laughs> oh wait, you were at E3? No, shut up. <laughs> Jackass. Yes, so I'm excited to see that if uh, it's being made by Tango Gameworks. I think that's what they're called. They're the same people that made Evil Within 2, and I heard Evil Within 2 is great. I bought that game, still haven't played it, but I'm really excited to play it. <laughs> and I'm all about creepy enemy designs, and that's what this game seems to be about. So I'm on board. Still don't know what it is, though. Which you can say about a million other freaking games that announced at E3. <laughs> uh, it, I believe that it takes place in the Avengers universe and <gasps> the Thanos snap. I and... forgot we had to talk about that too. Okay, so just before then too, I wanted to say thank you for the segue. Uh, just <laughs> before welcome. that, I wanted to say Ubisoft's, is it called Gods and Monsters? Is that yes. What? Okay. That looks cool. have no idea what it is or what it is going to look like or how it's going to play, but mm -hmm. I'm going to keep a good eye on it. Yeah. See what what that is. Yeah, and Watch Dogs Three looks pretty good and exciting. Yeah. It's not my type of game by any means, but I thought that was a good trailer, and it looks like fun. So I will unfortunately admit that I actually fell asleep during the Ubisoft conference when I was watching it. Double two. Yeah, it was somewhere between you know Tom Clancy's. The Division 2 and Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six and Tom Clancy's Cash Cow and yes. it's somewhere in there. Yes. But Watch Dogs 3 is probably one of my favorite surprises of a lot of E3. Like, not top of the list, yeah. but definitely top five. Yeah. Because I love playing that game. I love the permadeath mechanic. And yeah, yeah. It, it's very, it's a very zombie youth. <laughs> in a way and i like that except that it, it actually is way more involved than zombie u was i was hoping zombie u was going to have a little more to it than mm -hmm. just basically being a new skin you know when you when yeah. you die and, and come back but oh, i would love a zombie u too <laughs> i know me too but it didn't sell well and ubisoft is you know clearly only aiming at gigantic huge things like just just aim for middle of the road make a 40 dollar game you know <laughs> So I wanted to say about Watch Dogs 3, I was watching the Ubisoft conference with a couple other um, European YouTubers, they're like Zelda tubers, uh, Commonwealth Realm, Zeltic, and Dr. Wily. We're all sitting there and chatting and watching the thing, and then the 
Watch Dogs 3 thing comes on, and it's this guy doing this accent, this like, Oh, in, in Britain, this is the way that we talk. That kind of thing. And almost all of us at the exact same time immediately were like, Nobody talks like this. This is such an American doing a British accent, a British, like, TV accent. I think I think I read somewhere, I either read or I heard somewhere, that the, even the developers who were, like, writing the dialogue and everything, they were actually from England. Uh -huh. And they tried to up the stereotypes as much as possible. That's like... fine, because the game does look fun. So... As long as it's not taking itself seriously and it's doing that accent, yeah. and clearly it's not taking itself seriously, there was an old lady kicking a guy out. Yeah, and... I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hacker Grandma was hilarious. I, I want to they play as knew, Hacker Grandma. <laughs> they knew that that was going to play on the internet, too. Good oh, yeah. job. They did a good job with their marketing on that. But, yeah, it was really reassuring to be like, nobody sounds like this! <laughs> <laughs> we all had a good laugh over that. I, uh... Oh, and they threw in, like, basically every Britishism that you could possibly do. I can't remember it now, but they were like, oh, this wanker and something or other snogging and uh, daft. Uh, you know what I mean? They, like, in the one sentence, threw in every Britishism. <laughs> this daft crumpet over there. And she's like, mm, daft crumpet? I don't know. That sounds like a cookie you dropped on the Listen, floor. Listen, I am still <laughs> one. I'm still thinking about the possibilities of Zombie U2, where you play as Mono. And Bono? Yeah, Zombie U2. Ah! <laughs> oh, I hate you. <laughs> the physical disgust on your face was priceless. This is the o <laughs> This is the only time I will say this, but I wish we had face cam. <laughs> I don't like face cam, it's not what I'm about, but for my reactions to your awful jokes. <laughs> You know, maybe we should replace our, um, instead of the static image on our, uh, YouTube uploads of this, it's just a face cam of you <laughs> during the entire thing. <laughs> He's thinking about it, ladies and gentlemen. No! I'm thinking about, <laughs> I'm thinking about the segue. So speaking of horrible faces that you don't want to look at, Square's Avengers. <laughs> Not bad, right? I'll, t I'll give it that one. So... I forgot that this game existed, and then they talked about how they were going to debut it at E3, and I was like, oh, cool, yeah, I'm on board. They they were really hyping it up, too. Yeah. Like beforehand, they were like, and we're going to announce a new Avengers game by Square Enix. So this is, I think, being done by Crystal Dynamics, and they've been working on it a long time. I had, just because I didn't know what it was, I had no expectations for this whatsoever. So it wasn't like I was up here real high, and then they let me down. It was mm. like, I am completely blank, let, let's just go. <laughs> and then let's they see what you, you got. <laughs> and then they showed you the trailer, and you still have no idea what it is. This game looks like garbage to me, man. I don't know about you, but it looks really bad. Uh, to be honest, I actually had similar, like hesitations when I saw a Sony Spider-Man game. Like, the very first trailer I, I thought... did have apprehensions when I saw that. But I didn't think of, of it like this. I was just worried it was going to be a QTE Yeah. I can't say Foo! Fest. Foo! <laughs> I gotta edit all that out. I don't know, a QTE? What the Foo! do you say besides Foo! Fest? Uh, a, Q a QTE spider pile. <laughs> I, <laughs> I turned and nodded my head at him with such, such surprised um, admiration and approval. Yeah, it was it was nice. Anyway, go on your your thoughts on this this piece of crap. Yeah, I mean, I I don't really know what to think about it. The premise does sound cool. I would love to jump around as the different heroes. Yeah, um, I want to jump jump up and get down. So. <laughs> So, funny story, back when they came out with the last Batman Arkham Knights game, um, they were like kind of capping off the series and kind of ending it at that point, but they left the ending a little bit ambiguous that there might possibly be a sequel someday. Wasn't that what they were supposed to do with the third game and then they made a fourth game and then... Well, yeah, well, and the third game is actually a prequel, so... But anyway, oh, God. Um, I had this idea of what they could possibly do for a sequel. and they... A sequel to what? A sequel to Arkham Knight, and I... What? what? We're talking about Square's Avengers right now. No, it, it segues back, trust me. Oh, God. Uh, I wanted them to call it Arkham Legacy, and I wanted them to 
How did that you played as the entire Bat family of heroes? So you played as Batgirl, you played as Nightwing, you played as Robin, and then you could also play like some of the other heroes, and it's all about the effects of playing in the city with these heroes with different uh, movesets and different powers. That idea kind of is what I got of what they're trying to do with this Avengers game. Okay. Like, I can see feeling a difference, like you have one main city that you're playing in, and playing the game as Hulk, or playing the game as Black Widow, or Iron Man, it's going to have very different feels, but it's the same core gameplay to it. And I'm interested in that idea. I like that idea, but I don't know if that's what we're going to get, because I, for starters, I don't know if this is an open world setting, or if this is plain missions that you're going on that trailer didn't really tell us much of anything at all no it was this... just hype shit and then they started to go on about how hey we're gonna be coming out with new heroes later down the road okay that's cool but what are you gonna do with them hey we're this was another one of those uh roadmap games i forgot about that mm -hmm. oh i'm so tired of that crap also you tell me that you're releasing a game like in the latter half of the PS4's life, and then you're going to have a roadmap to content that comes out for three more years or whatever the hell. Like, I do not believe that for a sec. No. Unless it's something that they are going to be releasing along, like, when they release it, it's coming out for PS4, and then it's also a launch style for PS5 or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that said, my criticisms are up in the air because we don't even know what the PS5 is or if it's going to be entirely backwards compatible which there's mm. rumors of but whatever whatever all that stuff yeah my big problem with this game though is actually the design because i don't have any information about the gameplay at all because was any of that in the trailer even gameplay I don't like know. some of it seemed a little bit like that but just like doing a quick move or something but I, you can't tell that that trailer sucked it was a bad trailer mm -hmm. but my big problem with this is the design it looks like the mcu They've said that it is not related to the MCU. Then why are all the characters' designs exactly straight out of the <laughs> film and their costumes and everything, the world as well, and then their faces? It looks like a, a stand-in yeah. on, a, on a set. I, I can't remember who said it, so I'm not going to take credit for this joke, but I re heard somebody say... It's like, it's not like they could get the actual likeness. Like, they couldn't get Robert Downey Jr. to play Which Iron is Man. weird! So instead they got his stunt double, and they modeled <laughs> the character after his stunt double. Exactly! That's exactly what this looks like. And it's like, just go with a different art style. Look at, and of course I'm going to draw this comparison, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, with mm. its extremely comic booky, cartoony vibe. It looks like something you'd see on TV uh, for cartoons for these characters. And it looks great. You know, they're changing up the designs, mixing in a little bit of modern stuff from the movies, but it's mostly jumping around all over the comics and cartoon history for mm. these characters and choosing, uh, pushing an art style that m matches. I am wondering, however, if this is a, wasn't a decision by Crystal Dynamics or Square and more of a Oh, decision. they want to go realistic, for sure. Well, no, I'm thinking that this is more of a request by Marvel because they wanted to tie it into their properties. Cause... If that's the case, then why didn't they sell them the rights to the likeness of the actors? Because it looks so off like this. I know. It's, it's like they didn't want to sell them the rights to the actors, but they did want those costumes to be related to it as well, and that's where that, like... And that's the worst part. Yeah. It just, it looks so bad. And then the characters look like character creator characters. Mm -hmm. Like a preset. One that you didn't even, you know. Well, and that's another thing. They mentioned, not during the trailer, because that trailer told us nothing. But yes. you're going to be able to uh, edit and customize your character in the game. So is there a character creator, like, feature to this game? Like DC Universe Online? Something like that. I don't know. Like, they... This trailer told us virtually nothing except for who the voice actors are. It was just bad but, PR. Yeah. But with that said, I do like their voice actor cast. Sure. But I mean, I'm not going to play a game because of its voice acting cast. Like, a, the design of the game is already a deal breaker for me. Mm. Anyway, I'm way hyped for Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Mm -hmm. That's coming out soon. Me too. So let's end this by talking about overall thoughts on E3. Galen, got any, any final simple thoughts? It, this was just a very eye-opening E3 in general. It really kind of showed its age. 
in a lot of ways, and it really kind of showed the newer direction that the industry wants to be going in. I think it's going to work when it comes to the direct area. Um, I think they definitely showed their age when they were going over the hype and just sticking to those formulas that they have for the past decade that have, we can definitely, we know better than to trust. And I think that the old adage of we're going to focus on the new technology is definitely there. Like the whole s focus on streaming, because I think they mentioned it like three different developers mentioned some sort of streaming option. Four, no, because you have Google Stadia, you have the X Cloud, you have whatever Ubisoft is doing. I know they came out with something. And then you also have Bethesda saying, hey, we created this engine from the ground up that all of our games are going to be using in the future. And it was just like, I don't even know if cloud streaming is something I want in a game yet. You're pushing it pretty hard right now. Yeah. I appreciated what surprised me and what I liked, but everything else I felt very let down by. The, there, I felt like there was a very distinct difference between the high points and the low points. Like, there, there was a big gap between those. Yeah, yeah, I agree. For me, I was really happy to be at E3, of course, and <laughs> my biggest thing was talking to indie developers. Yeah. <clears throat> that was some of the most fun I had, is talking to people who are really creative and excited and full of ideas in this industry, and talking about how we can work together on something, possibly. All of these people had so much life in them and so much excitement that it just filled me with excitement as well. That was the best for E3 for me. Yeah. And lastly, there's some more Switch Mini rumors that came out this week. I am not talking about it. Oh yeah, we talked about Nintendo. Stuff I here. forgot all about that. <laughs> but anyway, we're not talking about that. Some there was like a Chinese website that put up stuff, and then somebody that posted like a really, I don't know, clickbaity uh, tweets like, "Oh, was this just revealed to me?" Like, no, it wasn't. And this, whatever. Yeah. The Chinese website had like a whole bunch of mock-ups of fan mock-ups of a Switch Mini as well. So like, I don't know. We'll see in the future. Just wait to see if it's going to happen, yeah. guys. I don't care. Yeah, I read the article that you're talking about. And really, it's not even talking about the Switch Mini as a console like specs or anything like that. It's just going over some possible accessories that could go along with it. Yes. And we've seen this kind of thing before in the past. From and... a third-party accessory developer. So yeah. So I'm, I'm not believing anything, and honestly, I'm not in any rush to believe anything, because, you know what, I'm perfectly happy with what I have for in the Switch right now. Like, Same. I don't need a Switch Mini, I don't need a Switch Pro. I'll wait to see what Nintendo actually gives us later down the road. I'm more interested in the games that they're coming out with. Yeah. If it's a slow news week next week, then we can bitch and moan about a Switch Mini. <laughs> But for now, let's move on to additional DLC. Yeah. Galen, what you got to recommend to the people? Uh, this week, I actually have a YouTube series that I stumbled upon recently called Girlfriend Review. I like her. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> this channel is adorable. Like, I know, <laughs> I know I used that word when I was describing the, the other developer earlier, but the entire idea of this channel is it is this girl's review of watching her boyfriend play various games and it's done from a very innocent perspective and the jokes are on point and she doesn't come at, come at it from a like begrudging perspective like oh my god he will not stop playing games or anything it's just like hey this is really f flashy and kind of fun to watch sometimes and i don't really understand it because i don't play games a lot but it's a lot of fun and I like that approach to it. It's very refreshing, and it doesn't have the usual YouTube personality of a lot of these kind of, a lot of things that you see on there, so. Absolutely. That's also what I find very charming about her, is it's just enjoyable to watch, and it doesn't feel try-hardy. Mm -hmm. It's cute. It's cute, and it's funny. <laughs> I don't know. It's pleasant. So the, the link that I actually included down below is a their review of e3 for this year oh and one of the big things is they actually got invited to like four different games it was like lego star wars cyberpunk 2077 
one of them was Final Fantasy VII, and I can't remember. Oh, uh, Outer World from Bethesda. And they were purely not even ranking the game. They were just ranking, like, the swag that they got by going to the events. And I was like, that's cute. <laughs> I like that. They're like, Final Fantasy VII looks like an amazing game, but they gave us absolutely no swag, not even a sticker. So Square Enix, how could you? How dare you? How dare you betray me? I thought it was cute. Uh, highly recommend them. Um, they're, they're really fun to watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so as for me, I am going to be recommending a live performance by one of my absolute favorite musical artists ever. I probably already recommended something from her before, but you know I don't care. <laughs> her name is Sheena Ringo. And if you want to say that not pretentiously, Sheena Ringo is her name. Sheena Ringo? Nope. Nope. Nope, keep, that's keep wrong. Trying, keep trying. <laughs> this is my time to shine, okay? Stop. <laughs> this particular performance I think is great because it shows a complete jump in musical style and it shows how she really transcends different musical genres as well. It starts out really weird and Bjorky. It's a mixture of like classical arrangements mixed with modern dance and hip hop even with a great like visual show that accompanies the music then the second song that it goes right into is a samba polka jazz kind of song <laughs> and it, they're just so totally different and it shows just the brilliance of this woman she's also doing the music for the tokyo 2020 olympics by the way oh, so hey. yeah so if you want to kind of get a little taste of what this musical genius is about check out maybe this video Pretty cool. And now we're on to our favorites. Favorite segments. What is it, Galen? It is listen to mail, listen to mail. Listen, 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 listen to mail. Listen, listen, No, that's listen, enough. Listen, listen to mail. That's all you get. You can't stop me. Oh my God, you're about to slap me. What are you doing? I gotta read the listen to mail. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to read an email that makes me slap Galen across the face, Ouch. you can send that email to... I think you left a handprint. Nope. NintendoEverythingPod at gmail.com. That email is NintendoEverythingPod at gmail.com. And if you wrote us in, your email might sound a little something like this. <laughs> this week, we have an email from... Eirik! <laughs> <laughs> From Norway! Yeah, uh, I'm actually really surprised that we got a no Norway email. So, we have uh, a lot of fans up in all of the Nords. I'm I'm all for that. I'm totally okay with that. Yeah, so. Skyrim belongs to the Nords, okay? I'm, I'm okay NEP with belongs to the Nords. <laughs> no, really though, we have, we have a lot of fans in like Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, where else? Uh, well, in Germany too, but I'm thinking of like the Northern Europe. Nice. Anyway, anyway. Anyway. Yo, what up all of our fans all over there? Hey, how's uh, it going? That's is fantastic. <laughs> Send me, uh, tweet me pictures of all of your beards. Because, you know, you're Nord, so I, I totally know that that's a thing. Galen also has a nice beard. I, I, I've been growing it out, so. <laughs> so, Eric writes in, Hello, and greetings from Norway. Love the pod. You, two re you really hate each other, and that's great. <laughs> I'm so glad you noticed, Eric. Thank you. Could you guys ask around on E3 about couch co-op? Or maybe recommend something to play that already exists? I need stuff to play with the wife, and she doesn't want to buy her own Switch. Anyway, love you guys. Especially Galen. Bet nobody spells it like that. Um... I'm not even going to try to say how it is written, but that is the first time I've seen that spelling. So congratulations. That That is a first. <laughs> okay, when I look at that spelling, my my mind does this. Gailin. <laughs> so, Oni, as the one Wait, who... no, shut up. You have to thank him. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Also, I love you too. That That is a great email. <laughs> <laughs> You're just saying that because he loves you. He, he likes you more. All of our emailer people, they just always say that they like you more. Bitch, I'm adorable. 
Are there not any Oni fans out there? There's like three. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Eric, um, I did have a thought about this. I, I gave it a good thought. Now, I didn't start out knowing what your wife likes to play, though. If she's into this genre or that genre, if she's only a casual gamer, or if she's a big old gamer herself. So, I got a lot of suggestions for you, and you can just, like, kick them to the curb, or take them as you like them. So, great co-op of some games that I have played are, of course, Kirby Star Allies, which is really easy, of course, it's a Kirby game. It can be as easy or as difficult as you want it to be. If you want it to be just the two of you, that way it's not too hectic on screen, or it can be the two of you and two computers, and then it's super crazy on the screen. That might be a little overwhelming for her. But, I mean, I know it's already all overwhelming for me, and I'm only one person playing, and then three CPUs, so it's up to you. Then, of course, Cuphead, if she enjoys a little bit more of a challenge. Travis Strikes Again has a great co-op mechanic, and that came out very recently. Yoshi's Crafted World, of course, is super cute, super relaxing. I, I would recommend that to any spectrum of gamers, whether they're into the easy stuff or the hard stuff. Hyrule Warriors is also great. Same kind of thing with Yoshi's Crafted World, where I'd recommend it to the entire spectrum. You can change that game to be as difficult or as hard as you want it to be. And it's got split screen, so it's great for playing on the TV, so you can see a little bit more screen. There's so many different characters to play from, too, so I think that people who really enjoy design will like uh, the options that you get with Hyrule Warriors as well. Then, of course, keeping it a classic, the Capcom Beat-Em-Up Bundle is fantastic. Depending on how old um, you guys are and your wife is, she may appreciate some of the older beat-em-up titles. I still got more. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't look at me like I don't got more, Galen. <laughs> that, that is that definitely an impressive list. I'm making a, the, I care about Eirik. Anybody who <laughs> writes into the show, I immediately like them a lot. I mean, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> nah, he sounds great. Also, I got, I got a soft spot in my heart for uh, Northern Europeans. I don't know what it is. Every single Northern European that I have ever met, I have always uh, become great friends with. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I got a <laughs> soft spot in my heart. Shovel Knight is a great game with great co-op. In particular, the co-op in that game is so good. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, some oldies but goodies. Bomberman on the Switch has good co-op, and plus that game goes for pretty cheap nowadays. Mario Kart 8, of course, is a total no-brainer. And Fast Remix, if you and your girl are into racing games. That is a solid, solid racing game. Also, <laughs> I have a big list! Stop it! Don't look at me like that. There are lots of other games that are actually first, first person, uh, single player, that's what I meant to say, that are like slow-moving puzzle games that you guys can actually take turns where you're figuring out the puzzle or hand the controller off to each other, whatever. Some ideas for that I came up with are Valkyria Chronicles, that is a tactical RPG that you can sort of hand things off to because there's moments where you're in the menus and the moments where you're on the battlefield and you have to be pretty methodical about what you do. Then there are four great indie titles that I also have to recommend that are pretty dialogue heavy and character heavy that I think would be really fun to talk with your uh, partner with, um, even a friend, to like discuss, oh, I think this character this, or oh man, what's with that character over there? And some of them are like mystery titles, so here they are. Darkside Detective, Thimbleweed Park, Oxenfree, and Count Lucanor. These are all single player games, but you can hand the controller back and forth or have a conversation with your partner about what do we do next, or is that person the killer? That kind of thing. <laughs> So my answer is way better than Galen's because it's longer. <laughs> well, I guess that doesn't really apply. Well, why don't you just tell me what your answer is, Galen? Uh, I should have answered first because, you know... <laughs> you you should have answered first. I'm sorry. That was, a, <laughs> that was a D-bag move of me. I'm sorry. Uh, fortunately, I do have some recommendations of my own, so... If you are definitely looking for, you know, I agree with Oni on this one that if you're looking for a racing game, definitely go for uh, Mar Mario Kart on that one. Like, that's a staple. You just got to go with that. I thought you were going to say Fast Racing Remix or whatever it's that called. 
the new game that just came out, Cadence of Hyrule, actually, is a great co-op game because what I really appreciated about it is that it doesn't do the split screen thing, it just keeps both of your characters on the same page. And there's something about playing a game with somebody and both of you knowing that you are in sync with each other. And the entire point of the game is to be in sync. So if you're looking for something to share a moment with your wife with, highly recommend that. That's really cool. I didn't think about that. But you mm -hmm. guys are both, you're doing synchronized fighting. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Like, I, I I have not played this game with my wife yet. I keep trying to get her to uh, consider playing it. It hasn't worked yet. But <laughs> one day. One day. Um, Why did you shake your fist in the air? One day. Because I'm being dramatic. Galen's wife, if you need help, please... Blink twice. She, she's she's in the other room. I know, <laughs> and I can't see her. Um, more games that will try to get you guys onto the same like wavelength. There is the Phoenix Wright games. Actually, you know what? It's only one person's going and playing the controller, but you guys can have an actual discussion on like, okay, what's the best evidence to present? What what are your train of logic here? Um, I had a friend of mine, actually, in high school that we used to watch the old uh, anime Detective Conan, mm. and the game that we had was we would try to solve the case before he could in the game, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when I was playing this, replaying this game with my wife, I got a very similar sensation of, I want to try to solve this case before the natural conclusion of what the game is realizing, and it's a lot of fun, and there's a lot of, like, fun talking back and forth and on this one. Another game I have is, if you want to stay on that safe wavelength, is keep talking, nobody explodes. It's a really cheap indie game. I think the normal price is like 10, 15 bucks uh, US dollars. But it's really fun because one person has the switch and they're looking directly at the switch. The other person has to try to interpret your descriptions of what the one person is seeing and refer to a manual to help you defuse a bomb. I mean, it, it's, cooperation. it's a lot of cooperation that goes along there. Not so much story, but the puzzles that are in there are never ending. I guess the only other game that I would recommend if you're looking for more of an action-oriented game are a couple of roguelike games like Enter the Gungeon or uh, Wizard of Legend. Those, oh, are those two-player games? Yeah, but oh. only for local co-op. They don't have any online features. Okay, okay. So, yeah, uh, fantastic games. I mean, the Switch is the perfect console, and there's so many options that you can play without needing to pick up a separate system. Uh, one other game that I did want to throw in here, though, is Mario Party. Um, oh, yeah! And, yes, I know what you're thinking. Mario Party, I want to actually keep my wife, not divorce her. But, um... <laughs> They actually do have a new mode in there where it is a partner-based mode, where instead of going on a basic board, you're playing more on a grid-based board. And it is you and your partner against another set of partners, and you're trying to go around this grid-based board to get stars and coins. Very similar rules, but there is also an element of cooperation that goes along with it. So lots of games, lots of great choices. There's a ton of suggestions that we had for you we both came up with totally different answers too. <laughs> yeah. and you know what all of them were great like there wasn't any game that i heard that was recommended from oni that was just like <laughs> see that's what we do we go above and beyond for those who write in so you better write in mm -hmm. and where can they write into nintendo everything pod at gmail.com that is nintendo everything pod at gmail.com Emphasis on the POD. Like capitalize it when you when you send it in. <laughs> flames on the side of my face. Heaving heaving breathing breath. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm the cause of your dyslexia. <laughs> so what is coming up? What is coming out on Nintendo Everything? Shut up, Galen! <laughs> making faces we're gonna have some of the interviews that i conducted over e3 coming out this week i'm also gonna try and do my best to get some impressions pieces out again i got some family emergencies happening so i don't know 
how much work I'm going to be able to get in, so I hope you understand, but please look forward to that. We've also got some reviews for some games coming up as well. we got a pretty packed review schedule for our reviewers. You can stay connected on our website, of course, nintendoeverything.com. We also have the Twitter, at NinEverything, and our YouTube, youtube.com slash NinEverything. That's where we've uploaded all of our E3 footage as well, so do check out all those new videos there. We got like a million friggin' videos that came out in the last two weeks. <laughs> uh, like a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And then you can tweet at me or follow whatever I'm talking about for the podcast. Sometimes I have big old breakdowns and then all I have to do is just like tweet it out. Feel a little better. Sometimes you just talk about eating sandwiches on the side of the road. <clears throat> I mean, that's just life. <laughs> That is at Oni underscore Dino. And you can see me really pitifully try to upload photos and stuff regularly on my Instagram. And it's really hard, but I try. <laughs> at Oni underscore underscore Dino. Galen, where else do you struggle? Uh, you can mainly find me doing my struggles at Twitter. At, <laughs> at Twitter? <laughs> on Twitter at mobius087 and hey you know what Let, let's keep this list going uh you guys shoot me or uh send me a couple of tweets on what your favorite co-op games are for the switch shoot him <laughs> please don't shoot me <laughs> i'm not i'm not a hard target there's no sport in it so hey what do you know this is a long ass <laughs> episode again <laughs> the curse the curse I probably have to lower the audio quality in this episode, like, a sh ton. So... Can I save there? <laughs> it's not a save. Nothing can save this. This podcast is going down in flames. Uh, really apologize for the audio quality on this episode, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Oh god, do I have another? Oh my god, this is not the last episode. There's another episode we have to upload next week! <laughs> oh my god, I forgot about that. Because it's the end of the month. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I might have to buy some more money. I mean, buy some more data. <laughs> Using money. Can, can you buy more money? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> support us on Patreon. We don't have a Patreon. We don't have a Patreon. We don't have anything. Somebody to... start us a Patreon. <laughs> no. <laughs> Donate to my PayPal. <laughs> where I spend the money to run this podcast every month. Oh, my God. <laughs> And help us, dear God, by um, getting us more listens with new listeners. This is, this is so pitiful. <laughs> Stay tuned next week and for the Nintendo. <laughs> Stay. Hang on, I'm going to say it like you. <clears throat> Stay tuned to the Nintendo. Bye-bye. Later. <laughs>